Fannie Willis's criminal indictment against Donald Trump and 18 others is the culmination of an investigation that has been going on for more than two and a half years. It is the most wide-ranging indictment to date. And despite how much was carried out in the public eye or, you know, has been since reported on, there is an incredible amount of information in the indictment itself that shows just how public actions fueled even more behind the scenes scheming. And to understand and fully appreciate this moment and this indictment, we have to go back to the very start, uh, just after Election Day 2020. On November 4th, one day after votes are cast, as it becomes clear that Donald Trump might lose the election, he delivers a speech hinting at a constitutional crisis. And the indictment says the speech was an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Uh, days after, on November 11th, President Biden is declared the president-elect. Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger announces a statewide hand audit of the presidential results because of the razor-thin margin. And he says there is no evidence of widespread voter fraud. On November 13th, media outlets project that President Biden has won the state of Georgia. And two days later, on November 15th, Rudy Giuliani, one of Trump's election attorneys and closest advisors, leaves an 83-second voicemail for an unindicted co-conspirator making what the indictment says are false statements about election fraud in Fulton County. On November 19th, election officials complete their statewide hand audit confirming Biden's victory again, and a federal judge dismisses a Trump-backed lawsuit seeking to block the certification of Georgia's election results. And that same day, Giuliani and two other lawyers charged in the case, Jenna Ellis and Sidney Powell, they make false statements about voter fraud in Georgia and other states during a televised press conference. On November 20th, Brad Raffensperger certifies Biden as the winner, David Schaefer, the former chair of the Georgia Republican Party, who was also indicted, sends an email that very same day seeking assistance for Scott Graham Hall, an Atlanta area uh, bail bondsman who is looking into election fraud on behalf of Donald Trump. Willis alleges this guy, Schaefer, like the others, knew there was no such fraud. On November 25th, Sidney Powell files a lawsuit in Georgia alleging a massive anti-Trump conspiracy involving rigged voting machines. And then you got to fast forward to December 3rd. Attorneys for Trump make the first of three appearances before state lawmakers making what prosecutors say are false claims about election fraud in an effort to persuade them to reject the state's duly elected and qualified presidential electors that were going to Joe Biden. On December 5th, Trump calls Georgia Governor Brian Kemp, urges him to order a special legislative session to overturn Biden's victory. Georgia's governor, Brian Kemp, rejects that. On December 6th, Trump calls individual legislators hoping to, quote, find elected Georgians willing to step across a constitutional line on his behalf. And then on December 7th, Brad Raffensperger recertifies Biden's win following a recount requested by Trump's campaign. The final tally shows that Biden won by 11,779 votes. And that's an important number to remember because the very next day, on 8th, Trump and others call RNC Chair Ronna McDaniel to seek the organization's help to coordinate the alleged fake electors scheme. It would end up involving pro-Trump electors in Georgia as well as six other states, uh, they are Arizona, Michigan, Nevada, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. And then on December 11th, the Supreme Court rejects the Trump-backed lawsuit seeking to invalidate millions of ballots in Georgia. On December 14th, members of the Electoral College, they meet, and they actually award Georgia's 16 electoral votes to Joe Biden. Around the same time, a group of 16 Trump supporters, well, they're meeting at the Georgia State Capitol and they're signing fake certificates, falsely proclaiming that Donald Trump, the winner of Georgia's electoral votes. And that's not the case. Those fake certificates are sent to the National Archives and thankfully, they are eventually rejected. December 23rd, Trump calls Francis Watson. She's the chief investigator for the Georgia Secretary of State's office. And he tells Watson that she would find dishonesty if she scrutinizes absentee ballots in Fulton County. And then on January 2nd, obviously not pleased with his call to Watson, 
Trump makes that now infamous phone call to Brad Raffensperger, pressuring him to, quote, find 11,780 votes. That is one more vote than he needs to overcome Biden's margin of victory. January 3rd and 4th are incredibly consequential days here. On the 3rd, Harrison Floyd, the director of Black Voices for Trump, calls and texts Ruby Freeman, who is a Fulton County elections worker. Floyd also calls Trevian Cudi, a publicist who has worked for Kanye West. And the next day, Cudi and Floyd pressure Ruby Freeman to lie. Members of the enterprise traveled from out of state to harass Freeman. They intimidated her, solicited her to falsely confess to election crimes that she did not commit. All of this according to the indictment. And then Freeman later testified to the January 6th committee about the amount of harassment that she had to experience and endure. Now, while all of that is going on, also on January the 3rd, U.S. Attorney uh, Byung B.J. Pak learns of Trump's call to Brad Raffensperger through media accounts. He's disturbed and later tells U.S. Senate investigators that it was clear Trump was ignoring DOJ reports on the lack of election fraud. Trump muses about firing Pac at an Oval Office meeting that very same day, calling him a never-Trumper. And on January 4th, Pac resigns. And then there is, of course, January 6th. Trump mentions Georgia 20 times at that infamous rally near the White House. He cites conspiracies about alleged irregularities and says election officials should find those votes needed to overturn Biden's victory. An angry mob then storms the Capitol, and as we know, despite the attack, Joe Biden's 2020 victory is eventually certified by Congress. But six of Georgia's eight House Republicans, well, they vote to invalidate election results in other states. And the next day, Kathy Latham, the Republican Party chair in rural Coffee County, Georgia, brings the bail bondsman, Scott Graham Hall, to the county elections office to breach election equipment. Latham, Hall, Sidney Powell, Misty Hampton, the county's elections director, they agree to copy software and data from the equipment, according to prosecutors. Over several more days, unindicted co-conspirators download that data. And then just one month later, on February 10th, Fannie Willis launches a criminal investigation into these efforts by Trump and his allies to overturn Georgia's presidential election results. And this timeline is far from over. As we mentioned, it has been two and a half years. It is an investigation that is still ongoing. And the very next date to look forward to, August 25th, that is the date by which Fannie Willis wants the defendants to voluntarily surrender. We'll see where it goes from there.